Fee, fi, fo, fum. I smell the ego of a self-assured man. Be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones and earn my bread. Or perhaps I'll take another route, twirl my hair, smile and pout. Can I get you some coffee or tea? Latte with a shot of extra giggly? Oh no, it seems he's made a company decision, putting us all in a jeopardized position. How do I approach a deputy director, CEO, chairman, or entitled collector to let him know that this mistake of his will cost us a fortune that I'll have to fix? I'll get creative, perhaps over lunch, since I already went through the wife last month. I'll ply him with awe until my face is blue, then slip in the helpless, what do we do? I could save time and cut him at the knees, diabolically make his blood pressure increase. The end game is always the good of the realm, but depends who's telling what to which gender at the helm. Emotions could get in the way of reason, and I could be accused of hormonal treason. Maybe I'll strategically defer to another, someone more compromised by the blunder, who happens to share the same egotistical girth, another size 42 upwards with a higher net worth. Whatever the strategy or meticulous approach, I adjust so as not to come off as an encroach. I do this so I can get hard jobs done. I do this so I can outsmart and outrun. I do this so that I can't be labeled. I do this to render stereotyping disabled. The role of a leader that wields a Birkin has a whole other type of diplomatic burden be it quelling the need to rip someone to shreds, using cotton instead to sever off their heads. I do what I do and achieve what I can as persona non grata in the land of man. Thank you. I still think that uh, it would be far better if Dominique just got to recite her blank verse or rhyming verse and um, left the panelists just to sit here and admire. But we've got 44 minutes, 48 seconds of questions and answers to deal with, so we better crack on. Question number one, well, it's not really a question at all. It's um, the panel is here to explore the world of women in powerful roles, uh, so I take it you're the powerful women. Yes. What does that mean? If you have to ask the question, I don't think, I think um, that means it's not... It means I thought I turned the question to you. I, I don't know. From your perspective um, as an actor. Power, I suppose, is... Um, power, I suppose, is just being able to um, influence and direct. And that's what you do with your business, isn't it? It's a soft, soft power business, yours, isn't it? Mine is a soft power business. So maybe you can explain a bit about who you are, and what you do and how you've achieved your success. Thank you, Nick. Um, my name is Siba Audi. I'm a communication consultant. I fell into this business. This is my third life. I started life as a, as a banker, and then uh, I, my second life was as a news anchor. I was doing uh, business news on uh, national television for eight years before I realized that people need some help with, corporates need help with telling their story. And I, I understood both corporate and uh, corporate stories and media. So I put the two together and I help corporates basically deliver their uh, news story uh, to their audiences. And when you can't help them anymore, they call a lawyer, right? Yep. <laughs> so tell me about me, because the law is ultimately about power as a profession, isn't it, really? Or would you disagree with that? Tell everybody who you are and the extent of your power and all the rest right. of it. Right. I'm Mahab bin Hindi. I'm the managing partner of Mahab bin Hindi law firm. I established my law firm in 2018. 
We're a commercial law firm and we do litigation as well. Um, I graduated from uh, London. Uh, I did my Bachelor's of Law in London and then I continued my Master's of Law in New York, Fordham Law School. Um, today we are a team of seven in the law firm. Um, we work in different types of uh, legal fields and thankfully we're, we're succeeding. And all women employees? A mix. All women employees? All women, 13 of them. Christina. We're 10 and we're a mix. And but your business is, because I, I didn't really understand the whole photo, so it's user-generated photos and advising people how to use user gen, kind of consumer-generated photos, but it's free, is that right? Um, so You've got to explain it to me, because I'm very stupid. Sure, so. <laughs> You're not stupid. Yes, yes. <laughs> so we, um, I'll start off by saying an answer to your question, which is I believe that technology is the most powerful thing in our lives, and those who control technology and technology companies are controlling you. So, um, so that's, I have a technology company I've been building for seven years now. Uh, it's, it is called Scopio, and we have, uh, we're called Netflix for Photos, so you can search a library of more than 200,000 images and download and use those images um, to power your marketing or creative, and um, there's four billion photos that are posted every single day. So we're taking more photos every year than in all of history combined, but then when we go to use them, they're really fake, they're authentic, uh, they're, sta or they're inauthentic and staged, um, so Scopio uh, stands for Scope It Out, and we're a fishing net for all of that image content to move it across the web so that people like you can see photos of people like you. Is that a good thing? I mean, to, to see pictures of people like us? I don't know. Um, so power, because you talk about technology as power. It used to be that information was power. Um, what, what is power to you? Can you define what power is? So power is time, I think. So the amount of time you're sitting on Instagram looking at your feed is the amount of time you're being controlled by that platform. Um, and that's, that's the whole world at, at your disposal. So I think before we used to think about local places, now you're thinking about the whole world. And that influence can change depending on who's running the business. So if you have somebody like Mark Zuckerberg running Facebook, then everything that he's thinking about and deciding is trickling down and being implemented that way. So I think that's where you want to look at who the leader is and then how big that company is and then what that's trying to achieve or get you to do or get you to buy or get you to think about. And I want to ask you this is about reputation. Is gender an issue when you're talking? Because you've got power and influence, and I think they're two different things. I'm not quite sure what, but they are. And I mean, are you, would you say, you're, I mean, if, if you're about the power of arresting people's attention, are you about the influence more, would you say? I think it's about how, how, what, how you influence them stays with them, how long you stay with them. That is the power. I mean, you can, you can spend all that time on Instagram, and that's really taken uh, a huge chunk of of your time, which is um, definitely determines uh, who you are eventually. What I'm doing is how long does the time that you have spent there, wh what you have learned there stay with you and how does it influence you to influence others as well? Because I mean, we deal in a, tr in a I mean, it, it comes down to time again and time is the, quant is the commodity that you're selling effectively. It's the expertise. I mean, we always talk about billable hours. It's, right. If you've ever watched a John Grisham film, there's always seems to be somewhere in there about the number of hours that a legal firm is capable of billing. Um, and time is why we're here. And time is why we're here. And we've got 38 <laughs> minutes and 33 seconds left, if anybody's interested. But tell me, how much would that cost? How much would 38 minutes, 27 seconds cost of your legal time? A fortune. Good, I'm glad. That, <laughs> that means power. That's power. Um, are, are, there, are, there, are there powerful female role models for you of in course. the legal profession? I'm sure you've all heard of RBG. <laughs> right, so um, our, I'm sure you've watched her movie as well, her documentary. RBG is Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She's 86 years of age. 
She sits in the US Supreme Court and um, sh she's amazing. She's, uh, she's, she sits there not because of power or prestige. She sits there advocating people's rights. She, she's a woman of equality and she, she's just there fighting for people's rights. But is that, I mean, this is where I, the fee fi foam fee fi fo fum business freaked me out a bit. Because could that not be an 80 plus year old man sitting there helping people fight? Wouldn't, wouldn't he be as, wouldn't that person be as valid in that role if they were a man? Of course, there are, there's a mix of judges, but she's one of the few women judges who sits in that, um, the Supreme Court, which is the highest level of courts in the US, in the United States. There's some visualizing that go happens. So like when she's building her company or when I'm building my company, she's seeing the highest thing that I can be is somebody like her. Yes. So you're actually going through the process of this is what will happen to me and this is who I can become. So your ambition is to become an 86 year old woman at the top <laughs> of the legal profession in America. What's your ambition? Not Never to become girl. Mark Zuckerberg, please don't say that. <laughs> uh, what's I mean, my uh, I mean, so, I mean, I think sorry, I, are, there, are there female role models in your area? So my ambition is to make an impact, um, to compete at the highest level possible and not limit myself professionally. And I think that is a huge mental barrier for, especially when you're young. So. I started my business, I was 24 years old, and I thought at 30 I was done. Like I was like, oh, I'm gonna build a company and sell it and I'll be worth $200 million by the time I'm 30. Did, did that happen? Maybe, <laughs> we, we don't of know. Of course, yet. you're only 26, so forgive me, yes. <laughs> but, but I think uh, there, that, that barrier of limiting yourself in terms of power, there's nobody above that 86-year-old woman. For me, there's nobody in time that has created technology companies that I can refer to. So my, uh, like my contemporaries are who I have to look at. And I think there's a lot of mimicking that gets you very far. So once you see how they speak, you can watch their videos, you can read their presentations, and then you can start to act like them uh, in a way that obviously fits your own personality. But that is a way that you can use that to get somewhere. And I think so when you're, when you're in our position and we're sitting here and you're listening to what we say, you might say, oh, you know what, Christina was right and she said this, I'm gonna try to apply it in my business, in my life, and it, will, it maybe works for them. So that's a, it's all copycatting. Because talking about um, role models and you mentioned, you mentioned when you're growing up and envisaging things, if we can come back to what it was like when you were a, a child, when you were growing up, were you encouraged or were you, what was it, I mean, I, was, I don't know, was your family background, did it make you who you, I mean, it obviously makes you who you are to a degree, but. Of course we are a product of our uh, environment and society, but I was very encouraged as a young girl uh, to, do, to be who I want to be, to, to be everything that I want to be. My father was my biggest fan. My father was my biggest uh, promoter, if you like. And he, he took me into the office with him and, and uh, made me do co contact his clients, even as a, as a teenager. Um, I never felt hindered or had held back by my, uh, um, by my family or by my environment. I had a very supportive environment as such. My role models were never just the women. My role models were always, any, I, I'm always, up until today, I'm always inspired by anybody that I see around me that has a, a positive attribute that I look up to, whether it is male or female, young or old, rich or poor. I'm inspired by the woman in Dubai Mall who sits in, in the ladies' room for 12 hours a day cleaning up. I'm inspired by her tenacity and patience, by her ability to, to go through something like that to provide for her family. I'm similarly inspired by the amazing um, man or woman uh, who's just built an amazing tech company and sold it for the $300 million or a, or a billion dollars. Role models are abound. And we don't only need to look at in one direction or at one gender. Yes, there is mimicking. There is um, a sort of a mirror image. It's easier for you to identify with a woman in a higher place. But my ambition is is that we all get to a point where we forget about the gender. We're dealing with people as people, as humans. 
and the attributes of each human is what it is. Um, RBG is a, f a fantastic role model. I watched the documentary and I cried and I clapped and all of it together. But also what I would like to see, I mean, she's the first woman on the Supreme Court. Uh, I, nobody talks about the, the first short person on the Supreme Court or the so first super Who was person. the first short person? <laughs> I forget his name now. We see, see we forget the, the short people. This is what we should be doing. We should, be, we, should be doing a, we should really be talking about short people because you're far more Most successful CEOs than I am. Are, uh, six foot tall. are there any short people in the audience? <laughs> you see, they're too ashamed to admit it, all of them. Um, that's the kind of prejudice we're dealing with. But you had to deal with a certain amount of prejudice, not prejudice, but a certain amount of kind of preordained roles as a child, didn't you? You had to convince your father to allow you to study, didn't you? Right, right. So my childhood was fun and, I mean, carefree. I have a very f supportive family. My father in particular, he always push pushed me to succeed. And when I went to the United Kingdom, um, I was only 18 years old, and it wasn't the norm back then. It's not the culture. Uh, but obviously now things have changed. Um, I was allowed to go. Uh, the reason why he, he felt at ease or comfortable in, in allowing me to um, study in the United Kingdom was because one of my best friends, Janan Bestaki today, she's a doctor. Uh, she's a lawyer herself. And uh, we went together and we, we studied together in the UK. Uh, we studied law, and when we reached uh, the time where we did our masters, she went to Berkeley Law School and I went to Fordham Law School. So she was in the West Coast and I was in the East Coast. And by the time we did our masters, I was alone. So things things have changed. Yeah, but you were also. I mean, you demonstrated that you could. I mean, I was a shitty student. So I mean, <laughs> you're obviously a really good one to get to an American university. <laughs> did you have an education, or did you just become straight, powerful and rich from, just sort from of the streets? Fourteen years old, or something <laughs> like that. Education of the streets. No, um, no. I um, I have my master's from Columbia, where I started my business. Uh, so I was supported in starting my concept within a very strong entrepreneurial university, and I think that uh, was it. Was always a dream of mine to go there. So I always thought, what's the best school I can go to? I want to go to that. What's the best thing I can study? I want to do that. And I was like that all my life since I was like a little girl. If there was a competition, I was there. And I really worked hard. And um, even to the point where my parents were like, why do you always put yourself in these positions where you like fail publicly <laughs> in front of people? Like you don't make the basketball team. You don't like win that debate, you know? But one or two times you do win, and then you're like, wow, this is great, I'm gonna keep trying. So that compelled me to go to DC for college where I studied politics. Um, and then I was like, this is, not this is not big enough for me. What's bigger than this? Uh, and then I fell in love with technology. Uh, so technology, you, th you, you still think that that's where the power resides. And yet, it's, although it's the, the quintessence of the contemporary industry. I remember when we talked earlier, you were saying that it's still almost one of the most male dominated that there is. Why, why would that be, do you think? And did you, I mean, have you experienced negative or positive discrimination in that field? Um, I think it's really important for people to see people that look like me or that look like uh, the founder of Rent the Runway or The Real Real or Spanx and they show um, everything that they've had to go through. I think for me, um, I, I realize that people are in my field, they see women as you have to be a female expert on a topic that women are good at. So if you're selling beauty products, it's because you're a woman so you know beauty. I am creating a company that has nothing to do with me being a woman. It's just, um, you know, it's a photo company. So because of that, they say, you know, you don't have a background in technology. You're not going to understand machine learning. You don't know how to build technology products. I, even to the point where my business partner just got nominated for Forbes 30 under 30 in media, um, which is really uh, spectacular. So I was talking to this very powerful investor, and I said, you know, my business partner just got nominated for Forbes 30 under 30. And she goes, when you talk to investors, um, do they ever just say that you're too young? And I was like, and then I had sent you this article that basically the Harvard Business Review had done this study, and they said, uh, 
when uh, VCs are asking questions to women versus men, uh, the questions for women are always, uh, how are you gonna mitigate risk for us? So how are you gonna let me know that you're not too young to, to have this company? And then on the other side, for men, they, they wanna ask, what will it take for you to get to X? So if I give you money, what will it take for you to get to this position? Whereas for a woman, they're saying, what can I do to make sure that you're not gonna lose my money? Um, and so there's a lot of positions like that that you have to get through and it's really frustrating. Um, and it really just takes people to be working hard and, and, and getting there because it's all, I, I really believe 90% of the issue is financing. Um, I thought the power was in technology, now it's money. Um, <laughs> where is power? Is, it, is power, I mean, it's, it's a serious thing because the, the companies, transnational, multinational companies are so powerful now that they supersede the law of the land. Um, I mean, do you find when you're working that there is a degree of gender presupposition about the things that you can represent? I mean, are you, are you allowed to do certain things by your clients? I mean, or do they come to you with specific? Nick, power is education, power is knowledge. Power is making your adversaries your friend. It's about coming to a common point where you, it's all about influencing people in a positive way, making them understand, making them believe in what you say. So I've always had a problem making anybody believe what I say. But you <laughs> but, are an expert in that. But a lot of times women I mean, show it, you, they no, don't tell you. No. They're like, I'm gonna show you. But by example, is that, more, is that more powerful than by words? Actions and words, I would say. You're the expert. Yes. You have to have the actions, to, then you have to have the words that speak the right action, the right way. Because we live in an age where perception is... Everything. It's very powerful to use the word that we're sort of thing. I mean, what is the perception of... I mean, what is the global perception of women today? I mean, I've always... I've, I've only ever had women bosses, so it's never really been... I've never known anything else, you know, both at home with my mother and then my wife, and then also in, in what I laughingly call my career, I've only really ever worked for women. But in general, would you have to make a special case to either mitigate, say, you know, don't worry, it's all right, she's a woman, but she's a clever woman, mm -hmm. or could you say, she, you know, she's going to get to the next level because she's got these qualities. How, I mean, in a real world, how would, you, how would you deal with that? Would you have to behave differently to do that? Would you have to advocate a different strategy? I think it's the same for men and women, how you rep how repre uh, present men and women as powerful. Pow being powerful is having the opportunity. Being powerful is having the, the uh, like you said, the, uh, the ability to direct or influence others. And so to be able to do that, uh, to present someone as that, you have to present them in all their attributes. And these attributes are, yes, they have to be smart, they have to be resourceful, and they also have to be uh, uh, caring and nurturing. So it's, it's a whole package of attributes that make up a, a powerful person, not just a powerful woman. So do you, do you agree? I mean, is, is, there a, is there a powerful woman and a powerful man, or is there just a powerful person in the real world, not in the kind of world of what we want? Can we ask the audience? <laughs> yeah, OK, let's ask the audience, because they probably know more. Do men and women have to be different powerfully? Carlos, stick your hand in the air. Which, you, which one do you reckon? South America, that's a notoriously uh, <laughs> macho part of the world, isn't it? Um, but I just wielded power. I got them to do something for me. You did? Yeah, that was so clever. Did you see that? <laughs> no, you got me to ask them to do something for you. That was like double power. What did you do? You didn't do it. You just sat there and waited for her to ask me to get them to do something for her. I mean, you're going to pay me in 22 minutes. <laughs> I know your fee, your fee, your billable minutes, your billable minutes. Where are you in all this power game? I'm watching, I'm listening, I'm forming a story. And then you're going to charge us for the advice. For telling the story the to the audience. I'm going to influence your audience. You've already influenced them. <laughs> I see Carlos is sitting up and paying much more attention now. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but I mean, are there, what, what, are, what are the most common, say the most common three conceptions, misconceptions made about you on the basis of your gender? In my field? In your field, three. Um, and stick to the question this time, don't ask the audience. <laughs> Okay, so the first one I mentioned was the female expert problem, which I feel like is a huge problem in technology, meaning you can only do something that a woman would be an expert in doing. Therefore, you can't make watches so because cooking, watches cooking, are cooking. You can do cooking, um, nah. dressmaking, ballet. Beauty, uh, clothing. Um, you know, they, they'll say, oh, you must, be sell you must be an influencer or things that have nothing to do with All right, next, hard next, tech. next misconception or conception. Uh, next misconception, uh, backing down, I think. I think like they think if you bully enough that you go away. You? I, I, Not me. I, for God's sake, I can't believe that. You're so belligerent. It's quite No, I think, uh, I think technology, that, it's a bullying like mentality where they, you just, they're like, 2% of women receive venture funding, 2% receive of the, like all the venture funding. Um, so can you imagine the, um, and you're like, think about it. Women have businesses. They are pitching their businesses. So they're getting rejected and pushed out. So I think uh, backing down is something that. And one more. And one more. That you don't eat lunch because it's, you know, you've got a, misconception. you're obsessed with food. I don't know. That's tough. I mean, but I feel so like good. I'm there so there are only unique. two. What have you got as, <laughs> as, as preconceptions or misconceptions about you based upon gender when you, you have to deal with? I think the first one is that my clients or prospective clients sometimes may, feel, may think that I do not understand the subject matter yeah. to be able to deal with it, to be able to tell that story. So the specialism um, or the ability to understand uh, finance or the ability to understand industrial manufacturing may not be there because I'm a woman. I don't understand manufacturing or industry. I, I, I try. I don't understand. I'm not an engineer, but I, I can try and understand it. I can put my head around it. But finance, again, it was another thing. You worked in finance. Yes. Why do you think, what, what preconceptions or misconceptions account for the fact that only 2% of women, if we're to believe the fake news statistic that you sent me over just now that was real news, um, I think there's a misconception what, that why? women cannot deal with, don't know how to deal with money. They will squander money or they won't know how to save uh, money. But even money on the other end, only 9% of check writers that are investors are women. So women aren't even investing. So you're talking about women always having to go to men to invest. I have four female, uh, w female investors. They're amazing. And I feel like instead of, like women should get into that mindset once my business is doing well or once I have savings, why don't I invest in ideas? Why don't I build my uh, pr like practice? So it takes a decade to even to get to that point. And, oh, uh, how, many, how much would a decade of your time cost? An absolute, <laughs> absolute four, I, I, I can't even, I'm no good at math, so I can't calculate that. But are there people making concept, do they have a, when they walk into your office or when they see you in court, do they have preconceptions about you just because you're a woman or? This may sound strange, but honestly, there are no misconceptions. Emirati women lawyers are in demand right now. Clients come to us, they want to meet with us. Sometimes I don't even have time to meet clients because I'm really busy, but they specifically ask to meet with me. Is that not just because you're very good at what you do? Is that what, sorry? Is that not just because you're very good at what you do? I mean, we always say that hard work pays off and we proved it yeah. and that's why they want to they want to come they want to have a meeting they want to discuss their case their issue and and do they do they do they believe in the sort of cliche of the listening woman is there something that women are supposed to be in, what, what was in the fee fifo fun bit of the money about, about sort of i've heard about his wife last week um i can now sort of basically destroy his career or something like that uh, i paraphrase um is, is, I mean, is there something that it's, if they have a problem, it's almost nicer to come to somebody who isn't threatening for them? I mean, is, yeah. is there something in that? I mean, I'm threatened by you, so don't, don't, don't <laughs> but, but, but I mean, I'm not so threatened not by all. you. Not at all. I mean, we're good listeners. We listen to people, and that's what they want. They want someone with, who'd listen to them and who'd advise them. That's why they yeah. come to us. Uh, can I add something there? 
I work with uh, executives, with government ministers, with, uh, with royalty even, to uh, train them on how to handle the media or on public speaking. And they will take a uh, comment from me. They would want, when we do the training, I'm in the room just with the, with the person, with my, tra uh, my trainee, mm -hmm. and they will take um, criticism, they will take, so I'm at the teacher and they're the student. I th don't think that if they had a man in the room, with, if the, so the trainee is a man, if they had a man in the room with them, giving them those instructions, telling them what they've just done wrong, and how to do it better, they would accept it. So in that sense. So do you think actually then it's that men have a problem with men in authority? Mean, I just have a problem with authority, irrespective of gender. But you would say that e even if the person was, the teacher was as expert as you are, and the person was paying just as much to have the same lesson, they would be less receptive to it if it were a man. I would say that, yes, uh, considering the student is a male from this region, from this part of the world, they will have a problem with another man giving them, uh, okay, they will have a lesser problem with a woman giving them those instructions. Okay. Everybody always finds terrifying dealing with you, I'm sure. I uh, find dealing with you terrifying, I'm sure. But have you, have you ever had to um, go through the fee fi fo fum routine when getting, doing this sort of dance of sort of, what was it, what was it, I, I, what was it about, it was... Yeah, then there, there was all that blood eating, Sorry. blood lust stuff you were doing, but there was also something about batting eyelids and fetching lattes. Have Latte you ever done any fetching of, of coffee or tea or the equivalent thereof? In a, in, a, in a position where it's actually done you good? Have you actually ever sort of decided, right, this is where I just bat my eyelids, smile, say, oh, really, how interesting a lot, and you get what you want? Or is it always the sort of <laughs> fist I'm a Taurus, fake glass okay. window? Um, OK, so I really believe in advisors and role models. So I, would, I do do that, where I just want to be in the presence of somebody that I admire, or I want just to, to hear them or be around them. And I'm, in that scenario, a student. So I, you know, I'd be happy, and I'm extremely respectful if I can go and fetch coffee and do something for somebody. Just like yesterday that the chef was saying, he said, you know, I was trained, but because I worked for six months every minute of the day, that, that, that mentor was willing to do that. So I think if you can sit in silence, again, you don't need to say anything. You just show that you're hardworking, and then you can. I really believe that when you work, uh, your work speaks for yourself. So in that way, you don't need to, to say anything, and you, your presence is very important. Now, language is also extremely important. Language. Language, the, the language we use. So now I have, when I'm in, in meetings, it's like, for example, like I'll be in a very serious meeting and I'll be getting a point across, and then somebody will say, sweetheart to me. And so it breaks my like, kind of conversation, and then it makes the whole room kind of, but it, I'm the CEO and I'm the one giving the talk. So versus when I'm in a meeting, I have a lot of male friends that have tech companies, and they walk in a room and they call each other, they, they say, uh, let's listen to the boss. What does the boss have to say? And they use encouraging words that puff up the person's ego or makes them stronger. So I feel like with my, the people that work for me or with people that I deal with, I equally try to use those words that what make the, them the, feel the, stronger. What is, if, if, what is the, if you're the boss, how do you give the kind of boss, let's hear it from the boss to the other employee? Do you see what I mean? What do you, what, how do you do, what is the, what is the kind of, encouraging word that actually gives, empowers people that this. Like words like boss, chief, uh, uh, champion, like those your words. Your honor, your honor, is that another good one? Your I don't use malad, those ones, malad, but malad, your honor. Them. Right, your honor, yep. Um, language is a big part of law, isn't it? It's about interpretation. Of course. Well, well how do you use language to, to sort of create power? What other types of language do we use to, to create power? Is that your question? Your type of language. How do you create power using language? You're being charged for every question you ask me. 
Sorry? You're yeah. being charged for every question you ask me. No, 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 I'm, uh, I'm being charged for a proper, is it not a no, is it what's a no win, no fee basis, I thought it was. <laughs> or do you not do that? Is that ambulance chasing? No, we don't do pro bonos that much. Okay. <laughs> so, well, I can't afford the answer, obviously, so that's power, <laughs> that's very powerful. Let's, let's, let's. But you teach people to, la to use language yeah. in a way is there, is, there, is, there a, is there a kind of triple bluff in the words that you're more powerful if you pretend not to be powerful? Um, yes, and I will say, I will quote Margaret Thatcher here, saying, um, being powerful is like being a lady. If you have to say that you are, then you're not. So you use all the words away, away from the words of power. Mm -hmm. Being powerful in the, way that, in the way that you are, in the way that you carry yourself, in the way that you treat others, um, around you, whether it is a client or a, a member of your own staff. Uh, it's in the way that you, you handle them, uh, the way that you um, speak to them in a, in a, way, in, in a way that em empowers them, so brings out the best in them. So choosing your language, choosing that is, is definitely power. Can humility be powerful? Of course, especially when you're building something, it's, you have to be humble like if you're because you know that just like in the master session that they were saying yesterday you're never going to be a master like you can be here today and here like this tomorrow so you're just acknowledging that you're trying and uh, that there's no way you can be arrogant even mark mark zuckerberg he cannot be Arrogant. Mark, Mark bloody he Zuckerberg could fail tomorrow. getting a lot of airtime on this powerful women panel. What is it with Mark Zuckerberg? He doesn't sound like a terribly nice man, is he, is he not? I'm saying at, he has maybe arguably the most successful technology company in the world, and he's still not, he has to be humble. And have you seen his dress sense? <laughs> <laughs> yes, because every guy in Silicon Valley just wears Do his they really ears, just dress as bad you have to wear that? You have to dress like that to go to investor meetings so that the investor thinks that you're smart. So he actually created a dress code for Silicon Valley. Oh, that's I love clothes. So you Nick, you should be dressing Mark Zuckerberg. You should be his fashion designer. <laughs> yeah, I that'd should be a good really. Idea. I should. I should. If I wanted to be powerful, but I'm dressing. I'm kind of the opposite. You remember power dressing? You remember? Yes. You're too. You're all too young. To, uh, when in the 1980s, if you if you can cast your minds back to a time before technology, we just had shoulder pads and filofaxes and. Uh, expensive wristwatches. Those were powerful things. We didn't have the internet, if it'll catch on, and things like that. So what would you, you go to court, how would you advise your clients, men or women, to dress if they're, or does it depend on what crime they've been accused of? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I carry myself in a professional manner, and that's my source of power. And I feel um, the dress code we, uh, us as lawyers, we have our Emirati women, we have our traditional attire. So we wear the abaya, as you can see. Mm -hmm. Plus, I do wear a robe when I go to the, uh, to the court. So you've got the, you've got the local dress, and then you have the bit of kind of English barrister dress Correct. tucked on. Right. It's fantastic. Yeah. Any, any, of, any <laughs> two outfits in one. Do you have an expert in your firm who advises people how to dress to look powerful? We advise people to be themselves, to not to put on a persona, unless they are going on stage and have to present to a large room in a particular way, to affect them in a particular way. And what if they are a deeply mistrusted individual with a very bad reputation? How would you advise them? I, mean, and I wouldn't actually, be advising them. <laughs> but they might need your I help. Select, I choose my clients. They, uh, they, so, you do, so you take your clients because they don't need your help? Uh, no, that's not what I said. I, I just said that I like to work with like-minded people, and so... Uh, uh, mass murderers and um, crooks mm, need not... Back in my days as a mass murderer, yes, not anymore. Was that in banking? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, finance is about the only thing that gets worse wrapped than technology around here, I think. It's quite <laughs> something, isn't it, really? Um, okay, now, in your experience, this is me rereading directly from my questions here, in your experience, do you see the workplace defined by the gender rat race, that were the words of the panel description, or are there areas of other, inequality, are there other areas of inequality that are more, more of an impediment or just more prominent? I mean, I think maybe social mobility or immobility, race, disability, height, I think you were height. very keen on height access to education, age or sexual orientation, 
I'm old. Um, are, are these greater barriers to achieving power than gender, do you think? I think they are all uh, valid. And I think the other thing that is valid is uh, you know, personal circumstances. For example, uh, I, I like to refer to um, women in my company. Five of the 13 women that I employ are mothers. They have come back to work, uh, some of them right after they had their children, and some of them 15 years after they've had their children. Uh, their time away from work can be an impediment. Mm -hmm. to them achieving um, their, what they want to achieve with their careers and if you want later on power in their life, as it were power to have the life that they want. Uh, so it's very important that um, these women are given that opportunity to have, that they are empowered to have the choice of going back into work and finding. Other than having to address like Mark Zuckerberg, what other barriers are there to success and power beyond gender? I mean, edu education, I think, is obviously important, but what about sort of age? I mean, because it seems that you talked a lot about people saying, are you old enough to do this? And then also there's, it seems to be axiomatic that any tech person worth listening to is under 30, because obviously young people always know everything, and that's been the way forever, but also there is the perception that modernity is only understood by the young. So is, a, is age more of a barrier? I mean... I think your mind is the biggest barrier. Um, you spend your entire... So basically the way I see it is all you're doing is unlearning. You're not learning, you're unlearning. So you say, I was taught to be like this, I was taught to worry about this, I was taught to behave like this, to dress like this, to talk like this, to be with these people, this company, and we're basically, when we're kids, by the time we're five, they've already created all these social constructs for us and this like Hollywood image of what our life should be like. So you have to basically spend, as I said, I think a decade, three years learning the, the language of whatever field you wanna be in, five years actually building or doing something, and then maybe you start to, to know. So um, what my solution is for that is that you're never gonna be better unless you're like constantly uh, consuming new information that helps you unlearn. So you're listening to podcasts, you're reading books, you're reframing your mind, you're getting more comfortable with failure as the failure is the path forward. So, and we're taught since we were kids, we needed 100% on our exam in order for our parents to be happy with us. You probably got 100% in all your exams, though, I think. So, so um, there must be something, some other. Some I other always ace it. What's that? You always ace it. Well, of course, but that's what you're paid for, I'm sure. Um, no, but, but I mean, would you, would you have got as far if you'd been non Emirati, for example, here? Or would you have just not been able to kind of even get into the legal profession? Or is that, is that, would that have been more of a barrier than being a woman, do you think? It's not about the gender. It's not, it's, it's about access to education. I was fortunate enough to have a great education which w widened my horizon. And yeah, I was lucky in that, in, in that sense. It's not about being Emirati or non-Emirati. It's just- But in, in your field, I mean, I, I, do you fit a prototype or a stereotype of the, the kind of female Emirati lawyer? I mean, are you the, Boethian sort of poet, po Boethian archetype of that type of thing. You mean me personally, or yes, when I you personally? Are you what if if there were a perfect Emirati woman lawyer, would it be you? I mean, would it look <laughs> like you and sound like you? And well, I hope so. I hope I'm a, I inspire other people. I set myself it's, up for that one. I think <laughs> it's, it's more about what you do and what you give. Do you think? And you, being a news anchor, will know exactly whether I'm right or wrong. Um, do you think women occupying positions of power is news, just for it? I mean, we've got the new editor of the yeah. Financial Times, yeah. for example. S somebody, I, it's a newspaper I work for. It's not somebody I know personally, but it seems that most of the excitement has been around gender. Is it still newsworthy, yeah. and is that a good thing or a bad thing? Thank you very much for bringing that up. I know Rula Khalaf very well. She was my cl classmate in high school. 
And uh, she's a brilliant person. She's got so much going for her. She's a very hard worker. She's a mother to two children. And all the t exactly the big noise was all about her gender. But she sounds like an incredibly capable. She's already also been put in a, like um, Christian, my friend Christian Amanpour was put in the Three Kings. She was in the Wolf of Wall Street as a, but she sounds like an able, like a super able person anyway. And yet all the noise was about her being a woman yeah. and the first woman in the history of the paper. Yeah, and that's, and that's the sad, what I'm saying is the sad thing. I mean, there needs to be more focus on how she is and who she is and everything that she has ac accomplished more than she is the first non-short person. Or to the first <laughs> non-short person to, um, well, you could always wear lifts or get your legs broken and put extra bones put in, I think. Um, okay, we've got one minute, 44 seconds left. Even you probably couldn't make so much money in that. So I'll just ask you one very, very easy question. How do you feel about being identified as a powerful woman? I like it as a uh, platform to be able to just be there so people can see that this is possible and this is a career choice. And I feel like that's very um, important, but I do want to be seen as an expert in my field and uh, that would be a powerful person. And I, and I just quickly, even looking in Dubai, I think being here and seeing everything so quickly change and so fast grow, I feel like that is, um, very powerful as well. And being in an environment like that is very creative and allows people to create more. So I think your surroundings also matter in terms of power. Being identified as a powerful woman, how do you feel about that? It's not about being identified. I think it's about doing the best you can, providing the best, influencing people the right way in a positive manner. That to me is much more powerful than being labeled as a powerful woman. For the long, same question. Same question. I'm trying to save different, you time. Different answer, I hope. Different answer. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> For the longest time, when I was working in, in news and television, I was identified as a powerful woman because I could affect people just being on on the screen and talking to 40 million viewers all at once. I never felt as a powerful woman. Right now, in my business and what I do with my clients and what with my staff, I I do feel the power that I have because I affect people's lives positively, and that's the power. But that's being a powerful. Person, person in the situation. Pardon? That's being a powerful person, not just a powerful woman. Right? Yes, I am a person before I'm a woman. Yeah, okay. And, uh, okay. I would just like to say that I think Arab women have reached an amazing point in the recent years. I mean, the youngest minister in the world is from the Emirates, Minister Mazroui, one of the most successful businesswomen in the world, is Saudi, Lubna Layan. Probably the greatest architect that ever lived is an Iraqi, Lubna Layan. And even the, the person running Dubai Watch Week is a woman, which also needs to be celebrated. But um, something stuck with me once that Zaha Hadid told our publication. And she said, I've achieved success everywhere in the world except the Arab world. And she said, if I wasn't an Arab, I would have got many more projects in the Middle East. Have you, any of you, ever felt slighted because you are an Arab more than you are as a woman? So let's say, Maha bin Hindi, have you ever said, have you ever lost an account because they'd rather go with an American lawyer? Do you ever feel it's more difficult being an Arab or is it more difficult being a woman? Strange, strange enough, I've never encountered that. 30 years ago, maybe, but today, no. Never, never came across that. I was thinking that it's really interesting that the conversation we're having about power and powerful women and how a lot of it is directed towards uh, the ability to direct conversations and uh, how people think and how people talk about certain things and how that dictates our behavior, which shapes the world we're in. And I was wondering how you felt as a man directing the conversation about women, uh, sort of directing power in that sense. Um, I don't necessarily know it's about power. It's about like being a conductor. You're trying to bring the breast out of the orchestra that sounds best and is, you use your judgment as to what is interesting and compelling and pre preferably not too expensive, I think, really, is the thing. So um, if the lawyer didn't speak quite as much, it's probably because the fee scale was slightly bigger. You're an entrepreneur, so you can talk the most. <laughs> and um, as you were on television, you're used to talking quite a lot anyway. So I think there's the answer, really. You just sort of make it up as you go along. That's what I've done all my life. I didn't receive much of an education either. So um, you know, I just feel I'm lucky to be here in the first place. That's no answer, is it really, Suzanne? No, but, but you know me. 
You know I talk a lot of crap. This is a question to all of you. Would you say that um, in your experience, um, despite professional accomplishments, despite uh, achievement irrespective of gender, there is still pressure on women to be conscious of their image and how they look, perhaps more so than men. And if you feel that that is the case, what would you say to younger women looking up towards you with regards to put, placing importance on appearance? Can I answer that? I, I, I mean, I probably care. I'm far vain than anybody else in the room. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's a gender-specific thing. I think you only get a... You, people say, do you judge by appearances? Until I speak to somebody or get to know them, how else am I going to judge them? Sure. Now you give a proper answer about appearance. And no, I, I fully agree with you. Appearances do matter, and it's very important that you look after... Uh, you, that take care, you take care of your appearance and you put a lot of thought into it, whether man, whether man or woman, um, more so these days than before. I mean, but also more importantly is that you stay authentic, authentic to who you, tr you truly are and uh, authentic to your story. How do you want people to perceive you? We said earlier, perception is everything. So the first port of call or the, the first... Uh, marks that you're going to get on any on your scorecard are your appearance and so it is it's absolutely paramount it's all about presentation and how you carry yourself regardless of which field you're in you were being you, you, if you were being if you were being if you were being paid for that you'd be given a much longer more kind of colorful answer but we'd have to go to you for that <laughs> they always say um you make people it's the way you make them feel um, than what you actually say. So I think if you impress people in a, again, authentic way and you impress them with your mind and you speak up, uh, then that's what they'll remember. They're not gonna remember what you were wearing. And I think that we put too much emphasis in how we physically look and not how we're um, giving ourselves to the other person and opening ourselves up and letting them see you know, beauty comes from within and um, character comes from within. So I think that's, that's where you need to put the emphasis. But I was in a, this study um, at one of the big tech companies uh, this past week and they had uh, five, uh, entrepreneur, or five female entrepreneurs and five male entrepreneurs. And they were asking us questions and they were paying for us to be there and, and answer. And all of the women were like silent the entire time and all of them were CEOs and all of them had built their companies and all of them had raised capital and the guys were answering every single one of the questions. And I'm like, who's going to remember you? You're not speaking up. You're here for your opinion. And I think that is the impression more but than what they were wearing. I remember said the least. I've been, I've been timing everybody and I know exactly what percentage of the time that everybody has <laughs> taken and you've taken by far the least. And yet you're no less memorable. Because your professional fees, my professional fees is going to be high for you. That's why I keep it short. You're very, very kind. Um, yes, question. Uh, I, we brought up Mark Zuckerberg earlier. I wanted to talk about Sheryl Sandberg. She wrote a book, who I'm sure you, some of you have read, Lean In. Um, Christina, did you, did you follow the debate that kind of happened after the book was written? I mean, I think a few people, namely Michelle Obama, talked about it as if it was it's kind of a ridiculous premise. This idea of, of um, I mean, you'll probably know this better than me. Um, and I just wanted to get your take on it, and maybe if others have, had an idea or perspective on that. That's exactly what I was saying, is that nobody, lean, nobody talks. You're there to be an expert, and you're not speaking. That lean in, talk about it, give your opinion. And um, I think that's where Sheryl Sandberg's right. She also said something that's very important, which said women mentally limit themselves in their careers, so they'll be like, you know, I'm in my 20s, but I still need to get married and have kids, so maybe I'm not gonna apply for that promotion. But really, in that book, she's saying, just keep going, and when you get there, everything will be fine, and everything will work out. Um, so I think those two concepts are important, but at Facebook, they don't hire women, they're not in leadership roles, they don't have a, like, a lot of equity in the company, so they're not really like showing that they're doing that. Instead, you have one powerful female figure. You know, there should be tons of women in the company that are uh, being empowered. 
Now, I was going to say the only opportunity that women have to impress their male counterparts, for example, in a business transaction, or not to impress them, but to, to conclude the business transaction, is in the meeting room or in the boardroom. We don't have the golf course or the fishing boat or, mm. or the, uh, the, the cocktail bar. I have none of those things. I have neither golf course, nor fishing boat, nor cocktail. How well are, are, you, are you stereotyping me? I, I'm, I wasn't even golfer. looking at you. I, I know, I know, I know. Some I know. men who, who conduct business in, uh, on the golf course, uh, and what I'm saying is men have more opportunity with men to have more conversations and uh, express themselves and lean, uh, express their opinions. Um, for women, it's all got to happen in that meeting room, in that boardroom, mm. in the, and if they don't do it there, they don't apply all their wit and all their knowledge uh, and all their empathy and everything that they have, then it's a lost opportunity. Do you so play a lot of golf? Do you play a lot sure. of golf? I play tennis. What? I play tennis. <laughs> Yes, that is that mean. the same tennis? Is that the same no, as golf? No, it's a no. different game. It, it, is a, it involved a ball and a stick. Two people across a net. And Two people, yeah. okay. And it's more difficult to conduct business conversations while playing tennis, you find. They're all further apart from the other person. You have to shout. So that's really good. It's an elite sport. I think you can still socialize. It's elite. Okay, we didn't get on to elitism. But I think that's a value also in here in the Middle East that no, there's more tennis, spaces there's more golf because courses or what? more social activities. It's hard in a business sense. Fishing, I suppose, fishing and golf courses. So I hear. I haven't been on any once. But even family lunches and uh, like there's always meetings of people. Everyone knows each other. So you can be in a safer environment versus in is, somewhere like New York where you don't know that person. Why would you go and hang out the with thing, them? The thing is women tend to uh, fear exploiting relationships. Women tend to think about relationships as, as friendships and you know, in, in social context. Men will use any relationship to conduct business and they will break the relationship when the, once the business is gone. For women, it's more about the personal interaction and the personal connection. So, and, and we're constantly conscious of not wanting to exploit that. We don't network as well I think as men. That, I think as that's well a national thing. I think American people tend to regard friendship more as a sort of commercial lubricant. Um, I do, I do, I would take issue with the fact that it's, it's, it's a, a male trope that all friendships are, not all, but more friendships are exploitable for business purposes. I mean, I, I think that, that that's almost a cultural thing, isn't it? Maybe. Uh, back in my days as a banker, I worked for Merrill Lynch in London. I was a private banker. Um, I was prospecting this huge client. It was going to be a $100 million account. Everybody in the firm was super excited about it. I pulled a huge... That was when $100 million was $100 million back then, yes. $100 million back then. <laughs> And I pulled this massive meeting for the client. People flew in from New York and all over the world for this meeting with the client. Everything went fine. A couple of months into the meeting, uh, into the, the uh, after the meeting, still the account wasn't being funded. And that's when the office manager stands up and says, okay, I think it's time to bring a man into the relationship. As in my relationship with my client, who's male, wasn't working, so they needed to bring in another. You would get, but that, the, the difference is now that person would be fired for saying that. Where today yes. they would be fired because you would blow the whistle on them and you say, yeah. and they would be, so that is change. And that's zero, zero. So everybody can go out now and um, uh, play golf and go fishing and all the rest of it. <laughs>